Well, why don't we just pause for a moment this morning on this Memorial Weekend to just remember those that have said yes, those that have made the sacrifice, those that we're grateful for. We want to say thank you to the families that have felt the sting of that loss on this Memorial Day weekend. We want you to know that we grieve with you, that we also celebrate with you today as we remember your loved ones. Because freedom was what was at stake. Um, that idea of defending freedom and preserving freedom. Freedom is what it's all about. And it's probably fitting today that we talk about spiritual freedom on this Memorial Day weekend. Talking specifically about living in the victory that we have in Christ. The victory that was won at the cross. You know, when I say that, I realize that lots of Christians today know about the victory in Christ, but aren't living in the victory of Christ. And that's what we want to talk about today. Paul always reminded us to keep the armor on, to put on the full armor of God, because we would be involved in a spiritual battle. Paul described it this way in Ephesians 6 and verse 12, when he said, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. It's a reminder to us this morning that as we live this life, this spiritual life, this journey physically in this world, that there's spiritual minefields everywhere we go. Around every corner there's spiritual ambushes, that there's booby traps. And if you and I are going to live in the victory, we've got to understand the nature of the battle. That's what I want to talk to you a little bit about this morning. Because God needs healthy soldiers for the battle. He needs soldiers that are whole and complete, that are well in the depths of their soul for the mission that he has called us to. And the battle is tough. Paul uh, told Timothy to tell the church, you and I, about this battle and the nature of the battle. He said this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verses 3 and 4. He said, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Did you get that? Suffer hardship with me. Interesting in the Greek, the idea there for hardship is this idea of bearing evil treatment. That you and I are going to have to suffer in the spiritual battle that there's evil in this world and that it's going to be a struggle and a challenge and a battle. That's why we have to be well. Paul went on to tell Timothy this, No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Paul telling Timothy to tell us this morning that we shouldn't get intertwined in the world's way of thinking and living because we'll never be able to please our commanding officer. God's looking for healthy soldiers that are whole and well and complete for the spiritual battle that lays ahead. And the reason is, is because it's risky business. Any soldier would tell you that. We have to be wise and thoughtful. We have to be reasoned. That speaks to our mind. We have to make good decisions and wise choices. That speaks to our will. We have to be soldiers that are confident and sure and courageous. That speaks to our emotions. God's looking for healthy soldiers so that you and I can be fit for the mission that He's called us to, and that's why we need to fully understand who we are in Christ, to be whole and complete. Hey, let's be honest. We live in a safety-first culture, don't we? We want to live life with no risk or no consequences. <laughs> we can tell that's true from how we're living right now. There's dangers out in the world, and we want to make sure that we're safe, that there's no risk. But the reality is life is filled with risk, particularly for the soldier of Christ Jesus. It's a spiritual battle, and there's risk all around us. And we can't lose focus. We can't become entangled with the affairs of everyday life and start thinking like others. We have to stay focused on the mission and the call of God. I was reminded of that and the importance of freedom this past weekend when I heard a soldier talking. He was a soldier that was in three tours overseas, and he said this, a safety first society is the enemy of freedom. He was talking, of course, physically about freedom, 
but it's true spiritually as well. That if you and I are going to be effective for the Lord Jesus Christ as good soldiers, that we have to be mindful that there's risk involved in following Christ. And I want to talk to you about the risk and the nature and understanding the nature of the battle this morning. There's really four components I'll just quickly share with you this morning. The first is this, the context of the battle. We've been talking all along that we are spiritual people in a physical body. And we live in a physical world with influences from spiritual beings. <laughs> that sounds kind of complicated, doesn't it? But what we're just trying to say is that life is always both physical and spiritual. That as long as I'm alive, that my body and spirit are one and the same I'm alive. The minute they separate, I'm dead. And as we journey through life as good soldiers, it's, it's always a journey that's both physical and spiritual. And Paul wants you and I to understand that the good soldier understands the nature of the battle, the context of the battle. Because if we don't understand that, we might try to separate the realities of our spiritual journey with real life. Think about it for me, with me this morning. As we think of King David... God called him to be the king of the nation of Israel, and God was taking him through spiritual training. But the reality of David being the king of Israel was going to be a physical one. He was going to be the king of a nation. And that training and preparedness to help God's people spiritually connect with him was lived in a physical world. We remember the story of David most by his epic battle with Goliath. That was a physical battle, but it had spiritual significance. You remember how it went? <laughs> the nation of Israel was up against the nation of the Philistines and they set forth their giant Goliath that would challenge the nation of Israel and nobody would step forward. King Saul wouldn't step forward. And so in David's preparation to be king, God had prepared him for that moment. Spiritually prepared him for that physical moment where he would be in a battle with Goliath. And he was a giant, wasn't he? As you look at Goliath, he was... He was some nine feet, nine inches tall, six cubits in a span, the scripture says. And he carried a javelin, a spear that was uh, uh, about two and a half inches wide in terms of the beam of the loom at that, in that time of that day. And the weight of the iron head of that spear was about 15 pounds, 600 shekels. <laughs> it was more like a missile than a spear. And here was David, King David, the one that would soon be king, the shepherd boy with his five smooth stones and a sling. It was a, a spiritual battle that was taking place, but it was, it was physical. You can't separate the two. And through that event, David showed himself his trust in God through that event and became, later becomes the king of Israel that could lead God's nation into an intimate connection with him spiritually. It was a spiritual battle in a physical world. Think of, think of uh, Daniel this morning, who, who was so connected with God. He loved to pray and talk with God. And then to get Daniel, the, they, the king made an edict, you remember, that you couldn't pray. And so what did Daniel do? He went up onto his roof and he began praying. And they saw him praying and he ended up in a lion's den. It, it, the, the nature of the battle was spiritual, but it lived itself out in a physical way. You and I have to understand that as God is preparing us to be good soldiers, that he's preparing us to spiritually be in connection with him because we've got to live that out in a physical world. And it's a challenge. There's going to be suffering and hardship. There's going to be evil that comes against us. And so we have to be prepared as good soldiers. Think of Job this morning. Job, who, who, who God allowed to strip him of his, his family, his finances, and even his friends challenged him and said, curse God and die. And in the midst of that spiritual challenge, Job said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That in the midst of the spiritual struggle, it lived itself on a physical reality. And we could go on and on thinking of Queen Esther this morning, who God raised up, beautiful Queen Esther, raised her up to a place of power and influence, to a moment when the whole nation of Israel was at risk. 
And then the word came to Queen Esther from God, right? Maybe, maybe God has raised you to power and influence for such a time as this, to save the nation of Israel. You see, these pictures that we tell our kids and teach our kids over and over are stories that remind us that it's a spiritual battle, but it's lived out in a physical world. And you and I have to understand that in terms of the nature of the battle if we really, really want to live in the victory that Jesus won for us at the cross. Because the second component of this battle is that we have an enemy. His name's Satan. His name means adversary or opponent. He has other names that describe what he's like. Can I read them for you this morning? He's the devil, the dragon, the evil one, the angel of the abyss, the ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air. He's the God of this world. You see why Paul said, He didn't want us to get entangled in the affairs of everyday life because there's a God of this world. And God has allowed Satan to to work in this world. And he's working today. He's the God of this world. And there's a spiritual battle. He's our opponent and our adversary. He's not our focus, but he is the impediment in the way of doing the mission that God has called us to. And the reality is, is that God has taken you and I as followers of Jesus Christ, and in essence, he's dropped us behind enemy lines. <laughs> I think of those parachuters that on a mission to, on their mission, sometimes they're dropped behind enemy lines, and it's done in secret, and usually it's a small squad of people because they're working in secret, but not you and I. God has dropped us behind enemy lines. The God of this world is working against God's purpose and mission, and we're not doing it in secret. We're doing it out loud, and because we're doing it out loud, it's possible that we could suffer hardship as good soldiers of Christ Jesus, and you and I need to know that, and in this battle, we have to be prepared for that, but just like David and Job and Esther God is faithful to his promises. They were whole soldiers. They were complete soldiers. They were good soldiers. And that's what we've been talking about when we talk about wholeness. If you and I want to make it in this journey, we have to be equipped and prepared, be whole and complete in Christ. Because of the nature of a battle reminds us that we have an enemy who's seeking to trip us up. But the good news about our enemy this morning is that he's a defeated enemy. That's why we're talking about living in the victory. Our enemy, Satan, has already been defeated at the cross. He's been crushed. He is impotent. He has no power over the people of God. David knew that. Job knew that. Esther knew that. Daniel knew that. The question for you this morning is, do you know that? That in this spiritual battle that lives itself out in a physical world that has a spiritual enemy that is trying to destroy us, do you know this morning that the enemy is defeated, that you can live in victory? I know so many Christians that know that but can't seem to live that. Still living in defeat. I want to remind you this morning about what the Apostle John said in 1 John 5, verse 18. He said this, we know that no one who is born of God sins. In other words, remember we talked about the reality that the pattern of our life is not sinning. We're not sinners anymore. We belong to God. That's what he says. He goes on to say, but he who was born of God keeps him. We're no longer sinners. We're saints. We belong to God. We're saints who on occasion might sin. And then he says this, And the evil one does not touch him. The evil one does not touch him. That though he's the God of this world, he has limitations. God reminds us that when he tempts us, he won't allow us to be tempted beyond what we're able. God is still in control. In Job's case, he only was able to do to Job what God allowed him to do. Because the book of Job is a story that shows us that Job was so in love with God that God wanted to show the world 
that even if he stripped everything away from Job, that Job would still love him. That Job would love God because he's God. He would love him for, without anything, without getting anything from God. He would love him. You see, the evil one can't touch us, the Scripture says, in this spiritual battle. And you and I have to know that. <laughs> he has no right to us any longer. In the old man, we, we were dead and he had rights to us, but no longer. He has no rights to us anymore. He only has power and control over us in terms of whatever we concede to him or give to him. The Apostle John made it clear he can't touch us. <laughs> Reminds me in the 1990s of that song that came out. Uh, I've never quoted a rapper before in my message, but you probably remember MC Hammer and his great hit, right? You can't touch this. And I share that with you this morning because I want you to remember that. He can't touch this when you belong to Jesus Christ. The only influence he has in our lives is what we give to him and concede to him. And that's the third point of the nature of the battle I want to share with you this morning is that the good soldier knows who he is. That's what we've been talking about over these last number of weeks. He can't touch me because I know who I am in Christ. I've been changed. I'm a new person. We've been showing you this chart that looks like this, that speaks of the old life when we were under the bondage of sin and Satan. And we were led by ourselves, and we learned to live without God and the old man. And that Jesus came and rescued us. We became spiritual people led by the Spirit of God, the power of God, the divine nature of God. We became a new man in Christ and we're alive and free, no longer in bondage. But yet today in the spiritual battle, the flesh is still alive. And the flesh is all those ways that we learn to live in the old man, our habits and our attitudes and behaviors. And that's alive. And so in this battle of the spiritual man and the flesh, we choose how we're going to live today. And that's the work of the cross. That's living in the victory of Christ, knowing who I am in Christ, a child of God, that I've been set free, and that I'm to choose to live in that freedom. Paul said it this way to the Galatian church. Remember in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and don't be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Don't go back to living the old life. The old life is dead, but all those patterns you learned in the old life in the flesh are still alive. Don't go back under the yoke of slavery. Remember I showed you last week what a yoke looked like? It looks like that. It's that wooden piece that would go over the oxen that would steer and direct them. There would be a lead ox. And Jesus said, put my yoke on you. It's easy and light. Be in step and in sync with me. What Paul is saying to the believers is don't go back to the yoke of slavery. Don't go back to bondage. You had to when you lived in the old man, but in Christ you no longer have to. Choose to walk in Christ and walk in sync. Every good soldier knows that. That's how we live in freedom. And Paul concluded this way in verse 13 of Galatians chapter 5. He said, for you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom, your right to choose, into an opportunity for the flesh. All of those old patterns of how you used to live in the old man. Don't use your freedom to go back and make choices to live in the old life that is dead. Walk in Christ. Do that through loving and serving one another. Every good soldier knows that. That's why we've been talking about it. And that's how you live in the victory. You see, the enemy, as I mentioned, is defeated. He's beaten. He's crushed. He's impotent. He has no power. And the question I would ask myself, and maybe you're asking yourself this morning, is why is this so hard then? And the answer is easy, because the spiritual battle is still raging today. We have an enemy who is still relentless persistent, and he's free. God hasn't locked him up yet, and he never gives up. He's defeated, and he can't win, but he wants to exploit what he knows about you and I to disconnect us from God so we have no power, that we become easy prey for him. 
You see, we would just hope this morning, wouldn't we, that the enemy would just quit. <laughs> Sometimes when you're playing sports and you're, you're beating down your opponent and, and defeat is evident and obvious, they just kind of give up. Not our opponent. Not our enemy. Not in the spiritual battle. He is defeated and done and crushed and impotent, but he's not giving up. And he's looking to exploit how he can pull us and separate us from God in this spiritual battle. And that's why you need to know the fourth component this morning of the nature of the battle, and that's the enemy's strategy. He knows he can't win, but he's not going to quit. He's going to do everything he can to separate us from Christ, to know, from knowing his power and his joy. You see, we see it in his nature. In John 10, Jesus said, The thief, our enemy, he comes to steal kill and destroy jesus said i came to give you life but our enemy has come to rob us from what god has promised us and the victory that is ours in christ and many christians are missing that i hope it's not you this morning god is offering to you a full and complete and whole and healthy life in mind will and emotions and the enemy is trying to steal that from you this morning and you know that because you Feel and sense the attack in your mind, will, and emotions. You see, here's how the enemy does it. Here's the strategy. It's strongholds. He's looking to take those habits and patterns and desires and lusts and addictions and attitudes of the old life that are dead but alive in the flesh. We learned how to live without God in the old man. And all, and all those ways we learn to live without God are still alive. And the enemy, enemy comes, he says, we're going to exploit those. So if we're not walking in Christ, not living in the victory, I'm going to exploit those. I'm going to develop strongholds in their life. Here's how Paul described it to the Corinthian church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and verses 3 and 4, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, though we walk... Physically, we walk in the flesh, we, we walk physically, and in the old life we learned how to live without God in the flesh. We do not war according to the flesh. It's a spiritual battle. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they're divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Next week we're going to talk about those divinely powerful tools that we fight with. But in this passage this morning, I want you to understand that phrase for the destruction of fortresses. What the enemy is trying to do is remind you of the old life that you had before you came to Jesus Christ so that you'll trip up and stumble and fall, get separated from God so he can come into your life and build strongholds. In military terms, he wants to build a military base in your life from which he can, he can navigate and do the work that he wants to do. He wants to build fortresses. The good news is that God has all the weapons necessary to destroy those strongholds and fortresses. But the best weapon is to not let him build a base in your life from where he can work. And the way he's trying to do that and exploit that is to find those places in the flesh where you learned to live without God before you became a Christian in Christ, those weak parts of your life, and he wants to exploit them. And if he can get you not to trust Jesus in Christ, then he can build a home base there from which to work. And I start to think, how can, how can the enemy do that? I mean, let me remind you this morning. He's defeated. He's crushed. He's impotent. He has no power over you. You can't touch this. How is it possible that he could build a stronghold in your life, in my life? How is that possible? Can I just say it simply and clearly for everyone to hear this morning? He does it with lies. He does it with deception. That's all he's got. He has no power to force you or make you or cause you. All he can do is exploit that old way of living in your life and see if, see if you'll choose to live in the flesh rather than in the Spirit, 
Rather than to walk in the yoke of your new leader, Jesus Christ, maybe you'll be tempted to walk in the old life. And when you do, he can set up base, set up shop from which to work in your life. But he has no power to do that. And so the only way that he can trip you up is to lie to you. I was reminded of a Christmas movie that comes out, and it's about a dysfunctional family at Christmas time, completely dysfunctional. And in the storyline where this family of complete dys- dysfunction takes place, there's a line that stands out in the movie that the father says to his, his grown sons, he says this to him: you can't spell families without lies, am I right? And I'll give you a chance to kind of spell that out in your head. And the reality is that's exactly how the enemy builds his family, with lies. And that's exactly how he destroys your family, with lies. That's how he destroys the people of God and the church of God, with lies. Because he has no power. It's his only way. And so if you and I walk with Jesus, we don't believe his lies. We walk with Christ. We live in the power of Christ. He has no place in our life. He can't touch this when we live that way. But if we give him a place, he will come and build a fortress, a stronghold in our life. Thank God that we have the weapons to deal with that if that happens. We're going to be talking about that more next week. Jesus made it very clear, the power of lies. In John chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus speaking to those that rejected him, rejected the word of truth. He said this to them, You are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He, Satan, was a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. Whenever he lies, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of all lies. See, that's all that Satan has left this morning to defeat you, to cause you not to walk in the victory that is yours in Christ. All he has is a lie. And that's why we are to walk in the truth. Think for a second if David looked at his spiritual battle that worked itself out in a physical reality. Think for a second this morning if David believed the lie that he should have approached that in fear. He would have been no different than the whole nation of Israel and King Saul. Imagine this morning if if Job had decided to listen to his friends and curse God and die. What What if Queen Esther, when the whole nation of Israel was at risk, decided in her uncertainty she would go another direction? Not realizing that God had lifted her to a place of influence and power for such a time as this. Those would be completely different stories if they weren't good soldiers of Christ Jesus who knew their identity in Christ, knew the nature of the battle, knew the enemy that they were fighting. They had no power over them. And they understood the strategy of the enemy. Don't believe the lies. I know you might be saying to yourself this morning, I'm not King David or Queen Esther. But let me stop you for a moment. That's a lie. You are. You are a child of God. You are a child of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are a saint of the high priest. You see, the enemy comes in with those subtle lies to knock us down, to make us think we're not anything special, and you are. And that's how the spiritual battle works, that the enemy comes in with lies to our mind, And it works itself out in will and emotions that we can see what we really believe by how we live and how we feel. It tells us what we really believe. Can I just show you in a simple way as we close this morning a a story? It's really a cartoon strip, a comic strip that showed up in the newspapers. It started in 1976. It went all the way through 2010. It was a comic strip that was around for about 34 years. It was called Kathy. It was about the modern woman who kind of saw her challenges and struggles and weaknesses. It was a 10-frame comic in the paper. It went like this. I want to share it with you. And as I share it, I want you to be thinking of, 
I want you to be thinking of mind, will, and emotions, this spiritual battle. You see, Kathy had a weakness. It was chocolates. And I want you to see the battle of mind, will, and emotions, or internal battle in this reality in a physical world. It goes like this, frame one. I will take a drive but won't go near the grocery store. Frame two. I will drive to the grocery store but will not go in. Frame three. I will go to the grocery store but will not walk down the aisle where the Halloween candy is on sale. Frame four. I will look at the candy but not pick it up. Frame five. I will pick it up but I will not buy it. Frame six, I will buy it, but not open it. Frame seven, open it, but not smell it. Frame eight, smell it, but not taste it. Frame nine, taste it, but not eat it. Frame ten, eat, 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 eat. (laughs) You see, that's the struggle of the spiritual battle. And that we're just talking about a piece of candy here. But what we're really talking about is those old attitudes, those old struggles, those old challenges, those old behaviors. And the, and the way the enemy comes to exploit that, to disconnect us from God and allow the enemy to build a stronghold in our life. You see, I share with you this this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It was Paul's fear. He said, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds would be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. (laughs) Funny, isn't it? All these years later, and it's the same old lie. The same old lie that Adam and Eve faced in the garden. (laughs) In that perfect environment, the enemy told a lie and separated Adam and Eve from God. Kicked them out of the garden. And it's the way it works today. The enemy has no power over us, can't touch us. But through the lie, if we concede territory to him, he'll take it in our life. Build a home base there from which he can continue to work. God wants us to live in freedom. The reality is that this isn't the Garden of Eden. This isn't Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. It's not just a beautiful day in the neighborhood anymore. We live in a world, spiritual people in a physical body, in a physical world where there's evil that exists that is trying to separate us from God and destroy us. And our enemy will do it at any cost. And God says, you and I are to live in the victory that was won in the Lord Jesus Christ, walking in sync with Him, staying connected to Him so that we can be whole. And you know what God calls us? Good soldiers of Christ Jesus. God, this morning as we commit this time to you, we really want to be good soldiers of Christ Jesus. We really want to be people who are trusting and following you from the depths of our being. And as we've had a chance to let you speak to our lives this morning, God, I just ask that those this morning right now that are ready to make that decision to say, I want to, I want to connect with Jesus in a real way and be made whole. I want to be a good soldier of Christ Jesus. I don't want to just be a soldier. I want to be a good soldier of Christ Jesus. I want to give you opportunity to do that right where you're at this morning. Maybe you're in your car. Maybe you're out somewhere watching on your phone. Maybe you're at home. But you want Jesus Christ to be the owner of your life this morning. You can pray this in your heart. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I want you to be the new owner of my life. I want you to kick out the enemy and all that he's done in my life, and I want you to be my king, my savior. Father, I want you to change me from the inside out. Father, we thank you today for the truth of your word that empowers us to live lives that are whole and complete in Christ Jesus. And we're asking, God, that you would send us forth in that power fully connected to you, experiencing the divine power of God. Protect us from the enemy that we wouldn't fall victim to his lies 
that we wouldn't give him opportunity to take root in our life, but that we would be walking under your yoke that is light and easy. Help us this week to walk in step with you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.